Guys and gals, as promised, today I'm bringing you part two of our scarf hold video. Today we're going to be looking at locks and joint wrenches. Here we go. All right, guys, so now we're going to look at how to do those locks. I'm going to show you four locks. Um, these are the most common and, and easiest ones to get. So first lock we have is an internal shoulder lock. So we're just looking at how the shoulder moves. If we just follow along with me, create a 90 degree bend in your elbow, get your arm horizontal to the floor, parallel to the floor, internally rotate until you can't move anymore. That's your internal shoulder lock. Now we have an external shoulder lock. Just go the other way. When you can't move anymore, maybe you feel a little bit of pain. Maybe you need some help from a partner to feel that pain, but here's our external shoulder lock. So internal, external. Next lock we're gonna do is an elbow lock. So basically we're just gonna hyper extend the elbow. And the last lock we're gonna do is a wrist flexion lock. So basically what we're doing is we're gonna support the elbow. We're gonna come down and press down on top of the knuckles and that'll create some nice pain in the wrist. All right, so we're gonna work on that internal lock first. That's the one where we internally rotate the shoulder. A couple key points on this. As you do this, one thing you wanna keep in mind is, once again, you wanna keep this 90 degree-ish elbow bend. If you allow that elbow to lock out further, they're gonna be able to uh, escape the lock a little bit easier, and it won't put the same amount of torque on the shoulder. So try to keep it as close to a 90 degree bend as you can. Next. If you allow your shoulder to elevate and protract forward, uh, you'll notice you can go further into the lock before you feel pain on yourself. So one of the key points when we do this is we need to control that uh, shoulder, and you're going to see how I'm going to do that now. So getting into our classic scarf fold, anytime I do any of these locks, get your knee really up high, close to their head, because that just creates extra support in trapping their elbow. If I'm doing transitions, whoops, he's out. If I have this up here and he starts slipping, go ahead. At least I have that leg to help and I can reacquire the elbow fast. So, knee really high up. Okay, now when I go for the external, or I'm sorry, the internal shoulder lock, it's real simple. I'm already in a position, we're gonna be moving his arm this way, right? This way, internal. So I got my armpit pinching the wrist, what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch hands. I'm actually going to take my radius bone, go underneath his elbow, judo clasp, okay. judo clasp. I need to push his wrist down with my armpit as I raise his elbow and I'm putting weight on his shoulder to keep it from rising. Okay, so pushing down with my armpit, raising with the shoulder. Now, if I rotate towards him and I start leaning back, there's the lock. <clears throat> if you are not able to get this, it's maybe because you're doing that. See what's happening to the shoulder? We'll try to get out of the way. Nothing's happening. I come down and put weight on it. There's the lock. I lay back up here where it should be. So once again, got my scarf hold. Bring my radius bone underneath the elbow. Judo clasp, push my armpit down, raise the elbow, turn into him, lean back a little bit, boom. There's your external shoulder lock. Quick little tip, if you have difficulty with this, you can try this. Take your forearm on top of the wrist, it's even easier to get it then. So now we're going to move into the external shoulder lock. That's when we are moving this way. It's going to follow all the same principles. Try to keep a 90 degree bend. Don't let their shoulder come up the same way by just keeping your weight on top of their shoulder. So here we go. We're in our scarf hold. And from here, knees high, got the elbow control. Now there's a couple different ways we can do this. I'm going to show you the way to do it with the leg because that allows you to have free hands and free hands in a scarf hold is just badass. So from here, 
I like to come over and support. I like to switch hands. Why? I'm gonna grab the wrist, knee really high. I've got him basically in this position right now. I'm gonna stack my leg on top and I'm gonna go real slow just to make sure his arm's okay. I'm trying to put his wrist on the mat. So I'm putting his wrist on the mat and then I can start pushing up. <laughs> Some people you can't go very far, so be careful. Some people, as you're going to do this, right here they start tapping. That's your training partner. Uh, you might want to stop right there and just go, okay, I would take the leg on top. So basically, once again, I'm here in my scarf hold. I get my knee high, pinch, pinch, switch. Now I'm supporting with this hand. Grab the wrist. Got that 90 degree elbow bend. I come stack my ankle on top and I start taking his wrist towards the floor. Now, if he's super flexible, his wrist isn't all the way down, but let's say it was, I can rotate my hips into him. <laughs> if he's still too flexible, then I can either take my leg, and take my leg and push up against his elbow, or my hand. So, real quick, real simple, just like that. Next, we're going to do our elbow hyperextension or elbow extension lock. And this is real simple. We just have a vice pushing down, a vice pushing down, and a vice pushing up. Okay. Now, the real key to this is, once again, if we're trying to lock the elbow, if the shoulder comes up, they'll be able to absorb some of that. So once again, we're going to put weight on their shoulder. In terms of where you're going to be on the elbow, you're going to have your leg or possibly your hand and leg, I'll show you in a second, on their elbow to push up against it. Now, you can be directly on the elbow, you can be towards the hand side, or you can be towards the shoulder side. If you go towards the hand side, you will have no lock. So you really want to go towards the shoulder and you want to get on the triceps tendon right above or right proximal on the elbow right here. So that's our contact point on the leg when we lock them, as you'll see in a second. The next thing is, well, let me just show you the lock and I'll show you some tips. Same setup, nothing ever changes. Knee high, switch hands to support, grab the wrist, pull it down. I can use this ankle, but it's usually a lot easier to just stack this knee on top, right? So I've got this, put the knee on top, start dropping the knee. Boom, there's a tap. Now, look at the line of force of the lock. If his wrist is turned this way and his elbow bends that way, and I go and apply this lock, nothing happens. Why? Because his elbow bends this way and I'm applying force down that way. It's not going to work. So what I'm going to look at is this part of his elbow. I want to see that it's facing up towards the ceiling. So I'm just going to grab his wrist and rotate it as needed. Obviously, I'll do it from here. Boom, now you can't see it, but his elbow is now pointed up like this instead of like that. And now it's very easy. Boom. I've got my weight on the shoulder. That prevents the shoulder from coming up. I've actually got my hand where we were grabbing before. I just left it there. And now I'm putting my hand on my thigh. So now I have really good um, accuracy in, in getting right on that triceps tendon. So then I come and I stack my leg. I'm going to apply force down here. There's a force being applied down on the shoulder, force being applied up from my leg, and it takes very little. Thanks. Great. So the last one lock we're going to do is a wrist flexion lock. Um, from wherever you're seated, if you have a desk, you can put your elbow on the desk. If you're sitting down like this, just put your elbow somewhere on your leg. And what we're going to do is take your palm and put it out on your knuckles, distal. Don't get up close to the wrist, it won't work. Get out distal, closer to the knuckles. You're applying pressure down. And since your elbow is wedged down, it can't move. You apply pressure here, and you can see we're just taking the wrist into more flexion then it wants to go, that'll apply a wrist lock. In practical application, here's our scarf hold, everything's the same, the knee's high, boom, 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 I get here, 
maybe I try going for an elbow lock and he gets real strong and comes up and I say, okay, cool. And as you can see, the elbow supported on the thigh and all I did was slide up and apply pressure down here. Real simple. If I get up too high on the wrist, I won't do anything because I'm just pushing through his ulna and radius bone. So I need to slide out towards the knuckles, double it up, boom, piece of cake. Okay, so all these locks are fantastic. These are things you do in judo, jiu-jitsu, mixed martial arts. You lock someone, they tap out, fights over, you win, cool, you get a belt, whatever. Uh, in the street, uh, people don't tap out. <laughs> if they do tap out, as soon as they tap out and you let go, they start throwing punches again. So we need to understand the application of why we would even do these locks. Uh, there's really only one time I would actually do a lock on someone, and that is if I was holding them, waiting for law enforcement or help to come, because I didn't really want to bash their head in, I didn't want to punch their lights out, so maybe I get them in a controlling position and I lock them. Drunk Uncle Bob's had too much, and the cousins are like, dude, can you handle this? Cool. Uh, <laughs> something of that nature. Uh, for a law enforcement officer, maybe this person is a little bit too much for you to handle. They are. Uh, too difficult to get into arrest techniques and cuffing. So you take them down here, you hold them, you put them in a lock, uh, and you hold them until another officer can come. Maybe you get one cuff on, and then you get two officers, three officers, and you can manage this person now. If you're in a high threat street fight, and you are able to do things that actually cause more injury, we now turn our locks into joint wrenches. What does that mean? Well, instead of a slow, ow, 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 that hurts, it's a boom. We pop the shit out of it. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how that works for all of these. So we have our internal shoulder lock, and I'm not even gonna get close to my partner's range of motion, I'm just gonna show you the speed. I get here, boom. So instead of slowly cranking this, I just bam, pop it. For this one, same thing, I would boom. I would drop my leg and go real fast. For the elbow one, I could just boom from here, or I could get here and boom, go fast. And of course, for this one, wham, I could just crank down on that super fast. That's actually gonna cause a joint injury. The degree of joint injury, of course, is gonna depend, uh, depend on a lot of things, their structural integrity, et cetera. But let's just say they might require some orthopedic surgery and some rehabilitation. So, if you're gonna do that, in a real fight, I want you to understand, make sure you are morally, ethically, and legally in the right place to do that. If you're in some low threat situation and you do a joint wrench and you pop someone's joint and they now need rehab, guess who's going to be paying their doctor bills? You. Uh, that's after the criminal charges. So unless you are in a true higher threat self-defense scenario, you really don't have any business doing joint wrenches uh, for the simple fact that there will be legal ramifications to it. So, I don't know, is there anything else you guys want to add to that? Pretty straightforward. Folks, if you like today's video, please leave a thumbs up, leave a comment below, and let me know what kind of videos you'd like to see me make in the future. And of course, as always, hit the subscribe button to be alerted when future videos come out. Until next time, go get your reps.